uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, just uh, wherever you are. Uh, it's a pleasure, as always, to be uh, learning together. Uh, this uh, class is part of uh, Folzman Adrisha, uh, Death, Love, and Life in the Thought of Franz Rosenzweig with Rabbi Zachary Truboff. Um, just uh, I'll be uh, sending everyone an invitation to become a panelist that would um, allow you to uh, participate in class on mute um, when you want to speak. You can also uh, turn on your video if you're able to, no problem if not. Uh, just a reminder to stay muted when you're not actively speaking so we can avoid the uh, background noise. And uh, you can also participate in writing uh, here in the chat box on Zoom or as a comment if you're watching us live on Facebook. Uh, and with that, I'll turn this to you, Rabbi Turboff. Thank you, Evie. Uh, as you mentioned, we're continuing in our learning about death, love, and life in Franz Rosenzweig. Uh, and um, I want to sort of take us back to the first session to sort of give us a sense of where we are now and where we're going. Part of what's both exciting and challenging about Rosenzweig's thought is the way the different pieces are interconnected. Um, he himself understands, he talks about this, that um, most philosophical works try to write an introduction that give you an overview of what is to come. But what makes the star of redemption different and what makes his thought in general different is that you really have to kind of go through everything to be able to understand anything because the different pieces are interconnected. And what you understand about one idea um, when you first under read it, let's say, uh, there's new light that is shed on it when you suddenly have studied the host of other ideas that are that he explores and that might be uh, connected to it. So it's always good to sort of understand what we've looked at and how, on some level, the pieces uh, the pieces fit together. What I tried to emphasize in that first session um, is the way in which Rosenzweig's thought is trying to make a space for that which is singular, for that which is exceptional. Uh, and the reason this is so important is that one of the things that happens in the way that we look at the world, and Rosenzweig attributes this to philosophy, but it's not just philosophy that does this, it's, it's actually something that's somewhat endemic to us as human beings, is that we try to create systems of understanding the world, pictures of, through which we can grasp the world that puts everything in its proper place, that explains everything, it makes everything explicable, right? We know why this happens, we know this belongs here, we know you say that, we know that consequence comes out of it, right? We try to create a sense of, of order to our world through which we can understand it, make sense of it, and enable it to feel stable and, and meaningful to us, right? The problem with that approach is that so often we encounter things that can't fit into those systems, into those frameworks of meaning, right? So we spoke about in the first session how death for Rosenzweig is one of those things that philosophical systems, political ideologies, uh, worldviews, um, all try to make sense of in a sense, or at least try to show you or explain to you how you can overcome it. But in reality, what we always discover in the confrontation with death is that no philosophy or ideology um, can really grant us sort of the eternity that we might uh, imagine that it can. Um, and it forces us, as Russell Spike says, to confront our own singularity that we as a human being are unique. There's nothing like us in this world. And therefore we can't fully be contained uh, within anything. Um, now for Rosenzweig, this, this emphasis on singularity uh, primarily begins with the, the notion of, of being a human being. Um, we also saw in that very first session how Rosenzweig himself is just an exceptional figure. Uh, the way that he gets Lou Gehrig's disease and yet he consistently fights against what the condition is doing to him. Um, not fighting against it, so to speak, so that he can be better. It's a progressive disease, like he cannot win with that. Um, but um, what he is fighting is to make meaning and purpose out of the time that he has. And his fight with his disease is very much a heroic fight because he's doing the impossible. Right? Most people with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease um, start to seriously consider suicide at a certain point. In fact, I think some of the first assisted suicide um, uh, options were developed in relation to uh, ALS. And Rosenzweig himself knows this is potentially an option because the greatest fear of ALS is you become locked in, right? Every muscle in your body becomes paralyzed and you no longer can communicate at all with the outside world, even as your brain function, your consciousness still uh, 
still continues. And the, the fundamental challenge that Rosenzweig faces is he has to determine, can life be meaningful under those conditions? And Rosenzweig in many ways does the impossible by still trying to make life meaningful, by, by being called to life and by trying to uh, continue to live even when it might seem um, uh, close, to, um, close to impossible. Now, the reason that's also significant is as we saw last week, for Rosenzweig, the human capacity to sort of do the impossible is very much tied to what he sees as the, re or the reason why human beings are created in the image of God, right? If human beings are created in the image of God, that in some sense, as we saw this in rabbinic texts, makes human beings unique, exceptional, priceless, uh, unlike each other and unlike anything else in the world. Uh, and for Rosenzweig, this aspect of human beings that makes us exceptional, right, very much is basically derived from that same perspective that, that made Rosenzweig exceptional, right? This notion that we as a human being creating the image of God means that we can never fully be contained within any box or any system of understanding, any conceptual framework. Every time you try to put labels on human beings, even if they're scientifically accurate labels, doesn't matter. Human beings will always find a way to exceed them um, because there's something about being human that enables us to be too much for this world, um, sometimes too much for others. That can make it very, very, very hard to be human. And Rosenzweig sees within that, that that, that essence of our humanity, um, which is really to be created in the image of God, because just as God is free, um, fully free, right? So too human beings have that capacity as well. Human beings have the capacity to say no. We're not infinitely powerful like God, but we as human beings can sort of say no to anything. Any box the world tries to put us in, um, we can essentially or effectively say no to it. That's what makes us exceptional. That's what makes us heroic. That's what makes human beings appear transcendent uh, at times because they do the impossible, right? One of the um, one of the striking things now about living in Israel during a war um, is you see people being dehumanized left and right, right? You see people being treated as things, um, but at the same time, you also see human beings who act in exceptional ways um, that can only be called holy. Right. And, and that's the, the reason this idea of the exception, the singular, is so important for Rosenzweig, because he firmly believes that is where holiness is to be found. That is where God is to be found. And those things that actually fundamentally break the systems um, that we normally use to, um, to, to, to make sense of the world. And we often encounter that in human beings. Um, and for Rosenzweig, and we're going to see this uh, today, right, the encounter with the human being in which our systems of understanding are shattered and we have to confront the singular nature of the other, the way in which they are too much, which they exceed understanding, which they don't make sense to us. Um, for Rosenzweig, that is the moment when we fall in love with another person. And that, that moment of falling in love with a per another person where we experience their singularity, their exceptionality, for Rosenzweig, that becomes the primary metaphor, the way in which we understand revelation. So I mean, we're gonna unpack that today, but that's the idea that we're gonna look at. This notion that for Rosenzweig, when we experience God, the truly singular other, right, it can only be understood like the moment when we fall in love, because there's something about the moment when we fall in love um, in which we also encounter that singular other, in which our understanding of ourselves and them and the world is forever fundamentally changed. Uh, and we can never go back to the way the, the things were, were, were before that. So that's, that's where we're coming from today. Um, before we get to the idea specifically about how uh, revelation and love are so tied together for Rosenzweig. I want to just take us back a, a moment here um, with the recognition of how difficult it is to sort of even think about the possibility of revelation as a uh, as a modern person, right? In a certain sense, and, and I, we talked about this a little bit last time, right? The great challenge of seeing human beings as we created in the image of God is that we just don't see it, right? Because we have our systems of ways of looking at things, and as a result of it, we don't see human beings as singular or as exceptional, right? We just see them as the list of adjectives or descriptions that we would apply to them, right? This is Hannah Arendt's famous point that we looked at briefly last week, right? That human beings only have human rights, right? If they we can attach to them the concept of citizenship, right? If so-and-so can be a, a citizen of a country, then they can be treated as a human being, right? But there's nothing, nobody who's considered less human than the person who is a state who is stateless, than the person who is a refugee, 
right? They are the most vulnerable. They are seen as least being in the image of God, Arendt argues, because in truth, we only see people as human when we can attach a certain adjective or description to their name where we can say, oh, they're, a, they're an American citizen. They're an Israeli citizen, right? Whatever it is, that's now we can suddenly see them as, as being endowed with human rights. Um, but without that, we don't really see them that way. And again, I, I don't have to go into any detail, but one can certainly see that playing out today, right? Who are the Palestinians that get to leave Gaza right now? Right, it's the ones with American citizenship, right? The the, the ones who are basically um, have that label. That is what grants them rights that um, others don't have, even if they want to try to leave Gaza and, and get into uh, to Egypt, right? So the great challenge is we don't see others as being created in the image of God. We don't see them as exceptional. We have systems and ideologies that fundamentally preclude that that possibility. Um, and so therefore, we just look at the world in a very black and white and, and narrow and narrow fashion. Um, so the question is, again, that moment where we can see the other as exceptional, it does not happen very often. Rosenzweig recognizes is the is the moment of uh, of love. And for Rosenzweig as well, the miracle of revelation, which for Rosenzweig is the paradigm of all miracles, right, is the moment in which we experience that that rupture, that break, that that singularity in the world um, that breaks our system. But the challenge is, as we get into the modern world, uh, we lose the ability for that to really be possible. We lose the ability for there to be things that don't make sense, that really don't make sense, right? Because again, we all kind of know this. If we experience something in the world today that looks kind of like miraculous, right? We assume there are people who could explain what really caused that, right? Like maybe it's a random chance, maybe it requires a scientific investigation, but we assume that miraculous events have causes, right? That's the fundamental nature of modernity, of enlightenment, right? We assume events have causes. Um, and if we don't know the cause yet, we'll figure it out someday. And we'll be able to show that it's not so, so miraculous, right? We have a very hard time with the notion of, 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 of miracles. Um, and this is the point that I want to start with, because part of what makes revolu re revelation so radical is that we don't really think it's possible, especially for us as, as modern people. We don't think miracles are really possible per se, at least in the way they were sometimes historically, uh, you know, to be under to be understood. So here's what Rosenzweig says about miracles. But again, he's he's talking here primarily about the miracle of revelation. But the idea that God would reveal God's self to human beings is an impossible thing. Um, and so we don't really think it did happen, can happen, or will happen. So here's what Rosenzweig says. He says, if miracle is really the favorite child of belief, that its father has been neglecting his paternal duties badly, at least for some time, right? To a large extent, if you have to ask what is faith built on, right? It is built on the idea of the miracle. Because if there's no miracle, then why would we assume that God exists or that God speaks or that we know anything about God at all, right? It is, it is through the concept of the miracle that we understand there to be a God and that God wants things from us as human beings, Right? And this is true, again, as sort of a foundational principle, you might say, of, 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 of monotheism, right? That, I mean, certainly from a Jewish perspective, we get this. We only know God because God revealed God's self to human beings. God revealed God's self to Adam, Adam in the Garden of Eden. God revealed God's self to, to Abraham. And God reveals God's self to the Jewish people at Harsinai, right? Like, you have to believe those things happened and that they're possible to assume that anything we do as Jews is grounded in anything that that is ultimately real and that those moments are miraculous moments, they're miracles. And if you don't think miracles are possible, then you're going to have a hard time with religious belief, right? And we tend, we don't want to think this way because we tend to be very rational. We tend to try to explain religion psychologically, sociologically, historically. It's our source of, you know, universal morality, right? The idea that there are specific events that happened in history that were miraculous, that ground our faith uh, is something that we don't really want to have to confront. No, I think we all know, right? If the if the Torah, I mean, let's use the Torah for a moment, right? If the Torah was in no way miraculously revealed, it doesn't reflect in any way whatsoever um, divine revelation. However, we might understand what divine revelation means. Rosenzweig himself has sort of a complex notion of what divine revelation might mean with the Torah. But if you don't believe that's possible at all, right, then it's hard to understand how as a Jew one could believe or have faith or direct feel they have some sort of covenantal relationship with God, right? You have to believe in revelation for to believe that that faith that grounds our relationship to God is in some way, uh, some way real. And when you don't believe in the miracle and you don't believe in revelation, then where does that leave you as a religious person? 
He says, for at least 100 years, the child has been nothing but a source of embarrassment, the child being the miracle, uh, to the nurse, which he, uh, which he had ordered for it for theology. In other words, what happened at a certain point is that religion stopped looking at the miracle as something that was good because modernity negates the possibility of seeing um, you know, miracles. And again, if we talk about the miracle of Revelation, there's no issue that is more fraught in you know, modern Jewish thought than the question of, is the Torah uh, a document of revelation? And what do we understand that to mean, right? Like uh, that is where the debates take place because where the rubber hits the road in religiosity or in religion deal are with these questions of miracle and revelation and historical truth, right? Those are the questions we we can't ever fully escape. There are also questions that Rosenzweig has thought about uh, thought about endlessly. He says, for once upon a time, miracles were no embarrassment to theology, but on the contrary, it's most effective and reliable confederates, right? If you want to convey faith to the world, right, or to anybody, right, the way that you did that was through the example of the miracle, because the miracle was concrete proof of, you know, something transcendent of God. He continues, he says, and it is a fact that today we are barely willing to believe that there was one such a time in which the miracle was a real thing for us that grounded our faith and we, we'd use it to communicate faith to others, and that it has only just passed into history. Just what happened in the meantime and how did it happen, right? How did we lose this sense of, of the miracle or the idea of the miracle grounding faith? Um, he continues, he says, the entire debate about miracles, beginning with Voltaire, and again, specifically in the Enlightenment, right? As Enlightenment rationalism is starting to confront religion, and you have to keep in mind is that many of the Enlightenment rationalists were not atheists or uh, or deists. There were many who saw themselves as religious, and they're trying to reconcile their their commitment to reason um, with their notions of of religiosity. And what they keep coming back to again and again and again is the problem of of the miracle, right? So basically, you get a hundred years of rationalist, but also seemingly religious philosophers trying to grapple with the concept of the miracle. Uh, and continuing without interruption for an entire century, um, the major achievements of the critique by Voltaire himself, by Remaris and Lessing, by Gibbon, different uh, thinkers, philosophers who dealt with religious questions around the miracle, are always directed at a very special segment of the miraculous event. These were all critical. I mean, they all sort of tried to explain away the miracle. Um, the attempt is there made to demonstrate the tradition as incredible. The reasons here that hitherto advance for its credibility as inadequate, in inadequate Whatever held out against the critique is explicable by natural causes, that is, without the assumption of foreseeable and therefore foreseen evolution. I know, again, the language is convoluted here, but what Rosenzweig is saying as follows, is that the way they criticize the concept of the miracle is by trying to show that miracles can have natural causes. Right? If you believe the world works according to certain natural law, immutable rules of science, of physics, right, then anything that appears to be a miracle in recorded history probably is, you have two options. Either it was made up, or there are some sort of natural causes behind it, scientific explanation for it um, to be made explicable. And if we can make miracles explicable, if we can make them make sense, if we can show them how they could happen, right, then we start to realize, well, well, then maybe they're not so miraculous in, 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 in the first place. And what the Enlightenment does with its emphasis on reason is essentially try to explain away uh, miracles. We can show, ah, if you look at the plagues, well, each one has his historical roots in natural events that could take place in the Middle East at that time, right? That's a classic way of looking at the 10 plagues. Um, if you look at the Red Sea, well, there are certain times of the year where the, you know, that's it's it's the um, the depth is lower in certain places, and you could imagine where it maybe dries out enough in which the Jewish people could have walked through, right? All these kinds of explanations are are very, very, very common. But what they do is they sort of suck the miraculous. They suck the sort of um, exceptionality of, of the miracle and of, of revelation itself. All right? He continues here. He says, the attempt to explain miracles away rationally is a confession that this belief is beginning to be ashamed of its child. Right? When religion starts to have to explain the miracle away as being something that could have happened and we can show you how it could have happened, that's the moment that religious belief starts being ashamed of miracles. Right, because it seems like it's illogical, it's immature. Children believe in miracles. Adults are not supposed to believe uh, in miracles. I'll, I'll give you an example, a personal example, which I, I think illustrates this for me very um, strongly. I was um, on my way back from the hospital, this was a year or two ago, with one of my uh, sons who was having some uh, medical tests. And um, we were parked not that far from Summit Pot, if you know Yerushalayim, um, and a major, major intersection, a lot, a lot of cars. And if you know anything about Israel, um, you might be aware that construction here is not always done in the most safe way. 
Evie can probably vouch for me on this. Um, construction here is not always done safe. There are a lot of workplace accidents in this country, unfortunately. And um, they were doing construction right by the side of the road, um, like very close to where the cars were in a somewhat unsafe way. And they were working on this massive metal pillar. And we were, my son and I were in a cab on the road at the red light. They're doing construction literally right next to us. When all of a sudden they, a metal pylon pillar slipped and it came crashing down right into the windshield and hood of the um, of the cab that we were in. Um, and it was, thank God we were fine. The driver was fine. There was just damage to the cab, but it literally came out of nowhere. Um, and it was very much, you know, it was very shocking. And I was particularly worried about my son and we ended up getting out of the cab and start walking just because it was like, now we're in the accident in the middle of this, you know, massive intersection. But as I'm, as I'm walking, uh, as we're walking for a bit uh, about trying to get uh, another cab, um, my son turns to me and he goes, wow, Abba, like it was a miracle that we were saved there. God like stepped in and like made sure that like nothing happened to us. Now, my son, I think was like eight at the time, let's say. Um, and the immediate response when my son said this in the back of my mind was like, oh, you don't get anything at all. Like these were workers being irresponsible, right? You know, thank God nothing happened to us. But it was, you know, it, the pylon went a little bit the other way or whatever, like somebody could have been seriously, um, you know, seriously hurt, right? And what happened to me in that moment is I had to confront the fact that for me, miracles don't happen, right? The fact that we were, thank God, saved wasn't a miracle. It was the incidence of where the pillar or pylon fell, right? But for my son, who, again, at the time, probably still not even now, looked at the world in a more naive fashion through a religious lens that we're all supposed to embrace as religious Jews. For him, again, there was something miraculous that took place there. And I, and I realized in that moment, I, I also didn't want to crush my son's, you know, faith that God had been there and something, you know, significant had happened because I recognized that his belief in that he had something that I was, was fundamentally lacking. And I think that's true for most of us, right? We see things and that might on some level be exceptional, singular, miraculous, but we don't view them that way. In fact, we do everything we can uh, not to view them uh, that way. We're ashamed at people who think that way, right? We're ashamed when we come across a religious person who thinks they were, you know, survived a car accident. It must be that God did a miracle and saved them. Even though, of course, if you survive a dangerous car accident, you're actually supposed to make the blessing of a mill, right? Which essentially assumes that God on some level saved you from a situation in which you faced, uh, you know, mortal uh, mortal danger. Uh, Rosenzweig continues here. He says, belief would rather have precisely as little of the miraculous to show for and no longer as much as possible, right? We want religious belief without having to worry about the possibility of miracles. We know the war, how the world works. Um, not always fair. It's not always easy, but it does have rules. It's explainable. It's explicable, right? That's the kind of world that we want to live in, particularly as modern people. But it's also the kind of world which precludes fundamentally the possibility of the miracle, right? And one of the things that we have to realize that um, you know, one of the major responses or major critiques of religious belief in the 19th and 20th century, you know, starts to focus around biblical criticism, right? We start not we as Jews per se, but German Protestant biblical philologists start looking at the what they see as the Old Testament um, as not a singular text revealed to the Jewish people at Har Sinai, right? But a text that is a composite text from many different authors over many different times. Um, maybe even with different meanings that were originally intended that when woven together into one document now means something other than what the original authors had had in mind, right? So that sort of way of viewing the Torah of the Bible, right? You could look at biblical criticism and say, well, when you look at biblical repetitions, at couplets, at historically inaccurate details, right? There's all sorts of reasons to look at the Bible or the Torah and be able to point out textually why maybe this wasn't a single document given to the Jewish people at Sinai. Right, you can the biblical critics have all sorts of reasons for that, but what you have to recognize first and foremost is that on a certain level, biblical criticism isn't really possible as long as you believe in miracles, as long as you firmly believe in miracles. But biblical criticism only becomes a real possibility when the introduction of the divine, of the miraculous, into this world no longer seems so plausible to us. And once it no longer seems so plausible, we start looking at around at those things which claim to be miracles or the evidence of miracles and start questioning, well, what's really going on here, right? So in a certain sense, when Rosenzweig sees this question of the miraculous um, as being important, you can argue that it really is foundational to so much of what we think religious belief um, is fundamentally all, all about. Now, the challenge is, is that if we live in a world in which we don't think miracles are possible, 
Well, that makes sense. That's the way most of us live our lives. We believe in science. We believe in reason. We believe in all sorts of things that ground a particular uh, worldview. Um, but the problem with that approach um, is that the way the world is now, in our mind, is the way that it is always going to be. We have a certain system, a certain ideology, a certain worldview that we can use to make sense of things. Um, and if we hold to that approach, um, which is very dangerous for Rosenzweig, again, what we do is eliminate the possibility of the exception of the singular. Um, we certainly don't see human beings as exceptions in the singulars most of the, singular most of the time. And we certainly don't see events as being exceptional or uh, singular, right? One of the greatest dangers right now, and I mentioned this before with the war here in Israel, are people who don't see this as something that challenges their worldview, right? Their worldview, their ideology already gives them the tools to fully make sense of what is clearly in many ways an exceptional event, right? And that is in some ways the scariest thing, right? Because Rosenzweig's whole point is when the exception comes, when the rupture comes, when the event that changes everything comes, that's what revelation is, right? Like, do you even have the tools to to, to understand it, to recognize it? One of, one of Rosenzweig's greatest fears is the way in which most ideological worldviews prevent the possibility of even revelation happening to you. Because even if it does happen, you're not gonna think it's revelation. You're gonna think it's something else, right? This is a real question for us. How do you know if God's speaking to you, right? If you start hearing voices, what's the first thing you're gonna start telling yourself, assuming you still have your faculties on some level, right? If you start hearing voices telling you to do things, you think that you're probably having a psychiatric episode, right? You're not gonna assume that God is necessarily talking to you. Right. So the question that Rosenzweig is often dealing with is how do we make a space for those things that don't that break our system? Right. How do we make a space for the possibility of the impossible? And for Rosenzweig, if that's what revelation is, the possibility of the impossible, where God, the infinite, comes down and, and enters into some kind of you know encounter with human beings, then the only other human experience that we know that points to that possibility is the, the moment, the event of when we fall in love. Right, because when we fall in love, right, for Rosenzweig, that in many ways is what revelation is all about. The moment when we fall in love is the moment when the other breaks into our world and we realize we're not alone in the world anymore. As long as we have our ideological worldview, there may be other people around us, but they're all sort of, um, you know, parts in a larger system. Right, the moment we fall in love is the moment when we discover that that system it no longer makes sense, and there's now this other, this beloved. Right, this person that we feel drawn to in ways we can't understand or explain, that we love them in a sense that our whole world suddenly now seems to revolve around this this other this other person. Um, for Rosenzweig, falling in love um, is very much a miracle. Right, we don't think about it this way. Right, like, but it very much is describing something that is miraculous. I'll read you some of the quotes, then I'll try to unpack it a bit more about why falling in love is is miraculous and why that becomes the paradigm for Revelation. Rosenzweig says here, he says, fam famously citing from Shira Shireen, this verse is very important for us, Rosenzweig, it's, um, love is as strong as death. death. Um, <clears throat> right, that love is as strong as death. And then Rosenzweig asks, as strong as death? Against whom is it that death shows its strength? And Rosenzweig's point here is that in the encounter with death, we discover our own singularity, right? We talked about this before, right? We discover there's no box that's fully gonna contain us right, that we are, there's only one of us. And when we come to an end, as I'll say, it's as if a whole world comes to an end. Um, what happens with love is it's the same kind of experience in that we confront singularity, but rather than necessarily just discovering our own singularity, death teaches us something about ourself. Love teaches us something about the other. Uh, Rosenzweig says here, he says, against the one, what is, who does, uh, against whom is it that death shows its strength? Against the one whom it seizes. You encounter death, Right, death seizes you and makes you realize something about you. Well, Rosenzweig's point is that love seizes you as well. Right, to, to experience the love of the other, right, it changes you, it grabs hold of you. He says, in love, certainly it seizes both the lover as well as the beloved. Right, love is that which grabs hold of you and grabs hold of the other. Right, if you're, I mean, I, I don't need to play this up fully, but if you're a fan of romantic comedies, Right, like the moment of revelation in romantic comedies, and it, it's best illustrated in romantic comedies, is the moment in which both sides sort of sort of finally realize the love that they have for each other. Often after an es a series of escapades in which there's been a lot of um, both sides not really realizing what's going on, but there's this moment in which right one loves the other, and that love is finally returned, and you realize how for them in that moment everything. 
uh, fundamentally changes. And there's this sense of them both being seized by their this love, right? In that moment when two people are the lover and the beloved are in love with each other and seized by their love, this is a point that Rosenzweig makes, it's as if the whole world fades away, right? There's something about being seized by love in which it's just like you and the other, and that's it. Um, he says here that love seizes both lover and beloved, but the beloved differently from the lover. It is in the lover that it originates. The beloved is seized. Her love is already a response to being seized. It is the anteros to the younger brother of Eros. It is the true true first for the beloved that love is as strong as death. Right? For Rosenzweig, revelation is the moment in which you encounter the other loving you. Right. This, this is the specific uh, the metaphor here. You encounter the other loving you, and encountering the love of the other, right? it ultimately arouses your love for them. It doesn't always work out that way. But that's the moment that that he's sort of uh, imagining here. The love of Eros inspires the love of Antiros. Antiros is the younger brother of Eros. Eros is desire. Antiros is sort of the response to desire. It's coming from the other way. Uh, and um, for Rosenzweig, that is what happens in Revelation, right? You are gripped. You are seized by God's love, right? And the question is, what do you do with it? Can you respond to it? Can you say, you know, yes to it? And in that moment when you can say yes to it, right, like you are forever changed and you are forever bound to the one who has, you know, called to you. So I, I want to play, play up a little bit more here about love as this moment of rupture, because that's what revelation is. Everything changes. There's revelation. This is very clear for us. It's like it's a moment which creates a before and after. Right. Revelation comes and that is the break. You are at the same person you were before. Your relationships with everything that came before are no longer the same. So I'll use a Jewish example and then I'll use a, a secular example, right? The Jewish example of this. And again, in Tanakh, you already have this idea um, of God's relational relationship to Jewish people being one of love and that revelation is one of love, right? Last week's Parsha, Parsha Lech Lecha, right? God calls to Avraham, right? You can see that as the moment where God is basically declaring God's love for Avraham. And when Avram is able to say yes to that, right, everything changes for Avram. Avram is no longer the same. In fact, that call results in a rupture within Avram's life, right? He has to leave everything else behind to go to a new land because he's not going to be the same person anymore, right? His name changes. Like on every level, there's a rupture. He is no longer the same person. He no longer relates to the world in the same way, right? In Yeshayahu, it says, or God speaks of Avram, Avram Ohavi. Right, um, that Avram is my beloved. Avram is the one who loves who loves me, who loves me, God. Right, that God's revelation is love, and Avram's response to that is is love. Avram is never the same. He's fundamentally changed by it. And encountering God, as we know, Avram encounters the impossible in a world full of idols, uh, of, which aren't real. Right, and with a plurality of these imaginary gods, in Revelation, Avram encounters you know the Rebbeinu Shalom. He encounters the uh, the master of the universe. God, the transcendent one, Elohim, whatever word you want to use. Um, and it's that which doesn't fit into his worldview, doesn't fit into the worldview of where he comes from, right? It is a total break and rupture. It demands a totally different way of being in the uh, being in the world. So that's like a religious example. The other example, I'll give the secular example, I don't know if we have any Shakespeare fans here, of the way love is a rupture of everything you knew. It's like encountering the impossible. Everything changes, right? So if, you, if you're familiar with the story of Romeo and Juliet, Right. So Romeo and Juliet come from warring families. And there's not like the story begins with this assumption that they're purposely like hunting each other out to fall in love. Or it's really an accident. There's really something incidental and contingent about the way that they fall in love. Anybody, anybody remember? Any Shakespeare fans want to tell us how how is it that Romeo and Juliet fall in love? What happens? So the families are warring. And Juliet is supposed to be set up with somebody else, some other person that their family is going to like, right? Romeo also was sort of like on the hunt a little bit to find somebody. They end up at a ball together um, and they end up dancing with each other, not really fully knowing, you know, who they are and what their families are. And there's really just this singular moment in the narrative in which the two of them confront each other and fall in love. Right. Part of what makes falling in love like revelation is the way in which falling in love is inexplicable. We don't get to choose who we fall in love with. It's just something that happens to us. And when it happens, like I keep saying, we are no longer the same. But what's fascinating with Romeo and Juliet is the way that love upturns their lives. It brings together these two people who should have nothing in common with each other and theoretically should actually be enemies. 
And suddenly, in that moment of love, right, where they feel now bound to each other, compelled to each other, right, suddenly all their previous history and identity gets thrown by the wayside, right? They're no longer Montagues and Capulets, right? Like, for Romeo and Juliet, their moment of falling in love is a break from all of that, right? Part of what makes love so scary is it's the moment in which you may confront that who you were before is no longer who you are going to be. All those attachments, all those facets of your identity, all those relationships can get shunted to the side in the moments of love. Because as I keep saying, love is a rupture. And that's what revelation always is. It's a rupture in which you suddenly encounter the singular um, and everything changes because of it. Now, for falling in love, right, this is you know so important because when we fall in love, it's like we're actually discovering another person for the first time. And this is something we'll play out in just a little bit. But it's like before we fall in love, we don't really know human beings. We sort of see them through our systems, through our ideologies. It's falling in love that makes us realize that human beings are singular, that they can't be fit within any kind of, again, system or categories or ideologies or, or anything like that. Now, what's fundamentally important for Rosenzweig here is that traditionally love, or particularly God's love, is often viewed as like a it's viewed as a lot of things, like a force or an attribute or something universal. Um, for Rosenzweig, revelation is an encounter. It happens at a particular time and place, um, and it is an encounter between two subjectivities, right? A revelation between God and the human being. When we fall in love, it's between us and another human being, but it's not an attribute. When we say that God, you know, these sort of philosophical or even uh, notions where like God is love, right? It's actually a Christian idea without getting into that right now, right? Like from Rosenzweig's perspective, God isn't love, right? Love is something that God experiences in relation to human beings. It's not an attribute of God. It's actually something that happens to God, right? It, it, it happens to God. And as a result, it, it happens uh, to us. Um, Rosenzweig says here, he says, love is not an attribute, but an event. Right? It's the event in which you fall in love. When revelation happens, when the singular breaks through your horizon. He says, and there is no place in it for an attribute. God loves does not mean that love belongs to him like an attribute, like the power to create, for instance. Revelation does not know of any father who is universal love. Right? Uh, that's not the way love works when it comes to revelation. Revelation is God and this human being right here, right now. God's love is always holy in the moment and at the point where it loves. Um, and it is only in the infinity of time, step by step, that it reaches one point after the next and permeates the totality with, with soul. Right? That, that love always is in a singular point and, uh, and that essentially, theoretically, ideally, you can spread out from, uh, from, from there. Um, um, just to give you the sort of specific description of the way Rosenzweig imagines the love encounter, uh, the moment of revelation, he says as follows here, and again, it's a moment in which God and the human being come face to face, right? Love is the moment where you encounter the other and you see yourself as bound to them. What's important to keep in mind here for Rosenzweig, this is very important, actually. We often imagine love as two becoming one, right? That's the, rom the, the fantasy of romance, right? I find the other who completes me. Together, we become this whole wholeness, right? That's not the way love really is. Right. The way that I think you, anybody who's been in love or is married <laughs> knows this. Love can never be two becoming one because two can't ever become one. No matter how much you know your spouse, no matter how much you know the one you love. Right. They will always surprise you and be an enigma. Right. You will never fully grasp the totality of, of, of who they are. And this is very important for Rosenzweig because love cannot mean the erasure of singularity. Love can only mean the realization and discovery of singularity. Right. It can't be like, again, I fall in love with my wife. Suddenly the two of us become this singular unit. Um, no. Right. What it means is I discover there's an other in this world who I will never feel fully know, but I still feel compelled and bound by. So here's how uh, Rosenzweig describes the moment of revelation. It says, but of course, for that, the infinite God would have to become so finitely near to man. The, the, the scandal of revelation for Rosenzweig is that it's a moment, it's an encounter. And how can God, who is infinite, God, who is all powerful, encounter human beings, right? It, it's, it's a contradiction, right? That God, who use, use Maimonides for a moment, right? In Maimonides' understanding of revelation, there's no encounter. It's the human being identifying through the faculty of reason with higher levels of reason, right? With certain forms of knowledge or certain 
uh, you know, notions that sort of surpass knowledge, right? But it's a cognitive enterprise, right? It's not an encounter, right? For Rosenzweig, revelation is always an encounter with something, someone. Uh, he said it's face to face, but it's important that it's face to face because face to face means it's both intimate, but it's not two becoming one. As long as the relationship is face to face, there's a separation. Uh, a named person to a named person. Um, that, that'll be important a little bit. That no reason of the rational ones, no wisdom of the wise could ever admit, right? Again, it's an impossible thing that God would encounter human beings. So from a philosophical perspective, it doesn't make sense, right? The great challenge of phil philosophy and religion is that it can't explain the possibility of revelation or, or the miracle, right? We can love God, but the idea that God could love us individually, you know, makes no sense from a philosophical perspective. He continues, he says, at the same time, it would be necessary that the abyss between the human worldly and the divine, an abyss which indicates precisely the impossibility of effacing proper names, be recognized and acknowledged. There's always an abyss between you and the other. Um, there's always a gap. There's always a separation. That's true in this world, and it is absolutely all the more so true between us and God. Right? We, and we have to hold the space for that gap. Right? We can't try to just close the gap. Romance tries to close the gap. It says two can become one. You complete me. You're everything I want you to, you're everything I ever wanted, right? I, you're going to solve all my problems by falling in love with you, right? Like that's not what revelation is. Revelation always maintains the gap, right? Love always maintains the gap, whether we like it or not. Um, it must be recognized and acknowledged so deeply, so really, and so impossible to leap across by all the aesthetic powers of man and all the mystical powers of the world. You can't get to God, right? You can't cross that gap. That no arrogance of the ascetic and no self conceit of the mystic would ever recognize in their contempt but the sound and smoke of names be the earthly or, or heavenly. I'm going to get to this idea of the names because it's going to be important. Um, but again, there's a moment of face to face. There's a moment of encounter, right? But there's also a gap which can't be, um, you know, which can't be, uh, you know, bridged, right? The fantasy of um, falling in love, the two become one, is because in the sexual act, that's the way that's sort of imagined, right? The sexual act between man and a woman is sort of this act of complementarity, which two become one, a greater whole is made, right? This fantasy of everything can be made right in the world, right? Romance is often at the core of our fantasies of revelation, redemption, right? Because we want to believe that everything in the world can be harmonious and whole, right? That everybody, men and women can live together harmoniously, right? Palestinians and Jews can live together harmoniously. Everything can be made right in the world. That is the fantasy of love. But that's not the reality of love. And the revelation of love um, reminds us that, that we can be compelled by the other, bound by the other, called by the other, but there's never going to be total wholeness and harmony, right? That's just not the way it works. And if there's if there's an appearance of that, you know, there's something being forced, there's something dangerous going on here. Rosenzweig alludes to this with this erasure of proper names, right? I have to erase what makes you singular. You have to erase what makes me singular if we're going to assume some sort of harmonious relationship can come into being. Because in truth, it's the fact that we don't fit in any box that makes us so difficult to be with as human beings. Human beings all are too much for each other, right? That's the challenge, right? If we could fit within defined categories and boxes, then we could fit together harmoniously. But we're always just a little bit too much um, for those things. And that's a good thing at the end of the day. It's also a bad thing, but it's what it's what makes humans you know, as I keep saying, created in the image of God. And the last point I'll make here about love and revelation, um, he writes in a letter to Edith Hahn, who will be his wife. I think it might actually be on the day they're getting married, if I remember correctly, um, where he's really noting here that the nature of love is that it forces you to look at the world as no longer as a narcissist, right? Before you fall in love, um, it's as if you are the center of the world, right? There's a fundamental truth to that. When you fall in love, you are no longer the center of gravity for the whole world. The world no longer revolves around you because when you fall in love, you discover that you start revolving around other things. You start revolving around other people. Other people matter more to you than yourself does, right? That's the nature of love. That's what makes love radical is I'm more compelled by their interests, their desires than maybe my own, right? One of the things that um, um, I often uh, you know, highlight with Rosenzweig here um, is I'll, I'll, I'll pick on somebody for a moment. So Rabbi Shai Held, who I have great respect for, recently published a book on love and Judaism, uh, which I look forward to reading all 560 pages of, I think I saw. But um, one of the things I said to, to Shai a, a, a while back was that, you know, again, there's my concern with some of the approach he sometimes uses is that love is used in this romantic sense, sense of like fixing religious problems, solving moral problems. All you need is love. 
right? If we only we had love, love can ground our ethical, our morality. It can it can bring us to the place we want the world to be. Um, but the problem with love in the way that we know it's not always harmonious goes to the way that love is described in Shir Hashirim. Right? Shir Hashirim is a fascinating work. And at one particular point in the narrative, um, one of the characters describes themselves as cholat ahava ani, right? That I am lovesick, right? Being love is being sick, right? Because it disrupts your world. It puts your world out of balance. Like I said, you actually care about the other who you love maybe even more than you care about yourself. When you're not with them, you're feeling terrible, right? Love is in some ways a sickness because love puts us out of joint with things. Love does not always make things harmonious, easy, and obvious, right? It's not easy being sick, right? Because it means something is sort of out of whack, right? And, and the challenge here is that what is out of whack for Rosenzweig is actually the most important thing because what's out of whack is that I'm no longer at the center of the universe. There's like now other, another there, maybe even multiple others. And that changes my orientation to the world um, and forces me to experience the world in a radically different uh, kind of way. In this letter to his uh, future wife here, he what he highlights is the notion that in love we discover the other. He says as follows, he says, do you know, speaking to Edith, why you were unable at the time to know the meaning of love? They had met each other a few years before they actually got engaged. Um, and I think he's sort of noting how back then or previously Edith didn't really understand love. Because in truth, as he says here, one only knows love when one both loves and is loved. Or you can't know love until you've experienced it. It's just one of those things. That's why I said it's a rupture. Everything changes, right? Like you can't know it until it happens to you. And it, it happens to you in the sense, not just that you experience the love of the other, but you love them as well. Everything else can at a pinch be done one-sidedly. Everything else in this world you can do by yourself, right? But two are needed for love. And when we have experienced this, we lose our taste for all other one-sided activities and do everything mutually. For everything can be done mutually. He who has experienced love discovers it everywhere, it pain, its pains as well as its delights. But when you love somebody else, you no longer are looking at the world simply through your own eyes. Right? This is one of the beautiful things about love is that you can, when you fall in love with somebody, when you love somebody, you have a particular experience. I'm gonna use this in the most sort of banal kind of way. I go to the museum, I encounter this amazing painting that really stirs me, that inspires me, right? What am I gonna think as somebody who is, you know, fallen in love with my wife, let's say, what I'm immediately going to think is, what, what would my wife, how would my wife experience this, this painting? What would it do for her? I want to share this experience with her. I want to see how this is experienced through her eyes, right? When you fall in love, when there's now an other in the world and you're not just at the center of things, you want to see, and you, in some ways you're compelled to see the world, not just through your own eyes, but their eyes as well. Right? That's what love does. It puts an other into the world. Um, and that's what revelation does because it puts God into the world. Uh, and when we experience it, right, again, we are changed and our orientation to the world itself is, uh, is changed as well. In many ways, love is a miracle, right? If you experience it, um, there is something fundamentally miraculous about it. it, it, it Rosenzweig, the metaphor is, is spousal or, or, um, 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 love you could say. Um, but a lot of this also applies with parents and children that when your children are born into this world, Right, it is the discovery of an other um, who is going to compel you and draw you in and force you to work, look at look at the world differently, whether you like it or not. Right, I think all parents know this. If I look at the world and want to think about how my wife would view it, what equally happens, I'm going to look at the world and want to and see it through my children's eyes as well. They're like they're, they're, our children also force us out of the narcissistic way we look at the world and force us to recognize we are bound to others and all of their you know, fundamental uniqueness, right? We look at our children maybe even more than our spouses as being singular and unique. There's, they're, they're irreplaceable, right? Like, I, you know, that's that's what it means to love somebody. Um, I want to just play this up a little bit more, even though I know we don't have a ton of time left, to try to show you sort of the rabbinic ideas behind this. Um, in this, many times Rosenzweig is drawing on rabbinic texts, not always explain, not always citing them. It's clear that his notion of, of love, um, the love encounter, that he is drawing on a very, very interesting rabbinic notion. Um, and he actually sort of implies a, a famous story in Masechet Brachot about the way in which, when we're sort of living the world through our ideolo ideology, our, our sort of system, it's as if we're kind of in darkness until the other comes and kind of like redeems us, it redeems us from that. 
right? For Rosenzweig, as long as you're sort of in an ideological worldview, it's like you're kind of doing everything by yourself. Even if there's other people by your side, you don't really see them. You just see them through the worldview, right? You don't see them for the singular, unique, you know, individuals that they are. Um, and the challenge is, is that like, again, being open to the way that the other can break our system, break our ideology to realize there's something else going on here. So Rosenzweig actually writes this in one of his uh, journal entries. But I, I just, it's one of my favorite Rosenzweig texts um, because we live in a world that encourages our narcissism um, to think that we really are the center of everything. And Rosenzweig is just reminding us that on our most basic level, that's just not the case. But he says here, he says, a person is able to practice in practice to educate himself, to redeem himself. Right? you can think that you can be an autodidact. You can learn on your own. You can listen to Shirim. You can read books. You can figure it out for yourself. You can imagine as if you're doing it all by yourself. You might even think you can redeem yourself, right? You're going to work on self-help. You're going to transform who you are for the better. However, Rosenzweig says, he is able to do this only at the cost of his human wholeness, right? And truth is, you can't ever really educate yourself or redeem yourself. These are things that only can happen in the context of relationships with others. Even when you think you're educating yourself or redeeming yourself, it's only being sustained through your relationships with others, right? One of the great um, reflections on sort of the, in, the lone individual um, is uh, Walden, right? Um, um, Walden's Pond, right? So the whole idea there is that the author is sort of going off the grid, living by himself, right? Like being his own singular individual. Right. And being like a self-made man, self-reliant in that way. What that completely ignores, apparently, and I, there's been stuff written about this, is that Walden's pawn was not like fundamentally isolated from like society. Right. Like he's actually still very much connected with society, even as he imagines himself being this lone individual living on, you know, living his like, you know, true, authentic life. In reality, he's very much reliant upon and in relationship with these society and systems. He's getting food. He's getting other things that are providing for him. So this idea of, of again, being completely on your own uh, is always an illusion to a certain extent. Um, he says in Rosenzweig says, in order to remain whole, the I needs its you. There's always got to be an other. But that's a discovery for us as human beings. We live most of our lives as eyes until we have that moment where the you breaks in and everything you know changes because we realize there actually is other people out there. He says one is unable to rid themselves of a headache on their own by placing their hand upon their head, right? If you have children and they have a boo-boo, what is the thing they always run to their parents to do? They want their parents to put their hand on the boo-boo. They want their parents to kiss the boo-boo, right? If you fall and hit your head, like my kids, can like fall a hundred times every time want me to like rub the, you know, rub them where it hurts and that'll feel good for them and they'll feel better. If I fall down, I can't rub myself and assume that's going to make me uh, feel better, right? It always has to come from the other. That's Rosenzweig's point. He says, um, you can't uh, rid yourself of a headache by placing your own hand on your own head. Rather, you are in need of the hand of your beloved, the hand to which you can be drawn into without remainder, right? To be healed, to be redeemed, you have to encounter something that is not you, right? There's something about the other that, again, takes us out of ourselves. Within his own hand, one cannot be drawn into without remainder, for what remains at least is the hand. At the end of the day, I can put my hand on my boo-boo or my headache, but I'm still there, right? It's only when I encounter the other that suddenly I realize there's something more transformative and profound going on beyond me. Self-respect, self-education, self-redemption, they're all perversion, Rosenzweig says, because they're just not true. Their denial of reality, all of those things can only happen in the context of relationships. There is a predisposition to it like self-love, but life should pe lead people out of this predisposition, right? Life should do that. It doesn't always do that. Now for, for Rosenstein, one of the classic examples of this, I won't read all the story here in detail, is the Masechet Brachot, where it's a story of different various rabbis who are suffering, they're in pain, uh, maybe they're ill, it's not exactly clear. Um, and they're suffering alone in pain, right? That's what happens when you're sick and you're ill, right? It isolates you from the world. And in each one of the stories, another rabbi comes to visit them to basically encounter them, right? To do the mitzvah bikor cholim, to visit, visiting the sick, um, and on some level to try to redeem them. And in each case, there's a recognition of the sufferings we experience. You can look at them as sort of religiously meaningful within some framework that you've developed for yourself. I deserve this. This is this is happening to me for a reason. Or the alternative the Gemara recognizes is that we have a right to say that we don't want these sufferings or whatever you know meaning is being attached to them, um, that we want to let go of that. Um, and we want to step out of that. But the Gemara's point is that we can only do that in the encounter with the other. Right. In this particular case where uh, Rabbi Yochanan falls ill, Rabbi Hanina comes to visit him. 
he asks him, do you want your sufferings and their reward? Rabbi Yochanan says no. Um, and basically Rabbi Hanina puts his hand out. Uh, Rabbi Yochanan takes hold of it and they lifts him up, right? Um, the Gemara then asks, why not Rabbi Yochanan raise himself? Why does he need Rabbi Hanina's help? Right? Clearly he could do it, right? The Gemara's answer, the prisoner cannot free himself from jail, right? And this is the very notion of revelation and redemption in many ways tied together, right? As long as we are alone in the world, we're essentially in darkness, right? It requires the revelation of the other to be able to take us out of that, to put their hand out there, right? And be able to, for us to grab hold of it and to lift us up out of the out of the darkness. Right? There's actually a very powerful metaphor here. There's a custom for some communities, I think Sephardi communities have it, either the end of Shiva or the end of Shloshim, probably the end of Shiva, where, where literally the mourners are sitting on the floor and the final act of them getting up is the community, their friends, their loved ones coming over and putting their hand out to basically lift them up, right? Out of their pain, out of their suffering, out of their loss. Only the experience of the other can fundamentally do that to us. Now, when I first read the Rosenzweig journal, it actually made me think of this Gemara because there's sort of a notion here, right? The hand that takes away the headache, right? The encounter with the other, right? You see the illusions a little bit. So it's only later I discovered in one of um, Rosenzweig's letters, he actually writes about this story explicitly. It's clearly what I think he had in mind in the journal entry. And he notes that as long as we are suffering in darkness and it's as if nobody else exists in the world, it's like we're trapped in our ideological worldview. Right? It requires another person to break that worldview to make us realize that we are not the center of existence. That's what happens in the moment of revelation. The, uh, the last thing I'll say here um, is that for Rosenzweig, the moment of revelation, the moment when we encounter the love of the other, or their love for us, their desire for us, um, is when they call our name. Right, Because something sort of almost magical happens when you your name is called, is that you automatically turn to wherever you hear the sound coming from. Right. This is a very, very fundamental point for Rosenzweig, right? In the moments of revelation, remember I said we're no longer the same person anymore afterwards. It's like our whole world changes. Everything changes. It's like we're wrenched out of the previous existence. Or Avraham, again, is the example here. God calls to Avraham. Avraham leaves everything else behind. So what's fascinating is when we hear our name being called, right? It's as if it takes us out of whatever else we were doing, right? We can be totally immersed in something and we hear our name and it like, jolts us away. That's, that's the example Rosenzweig uses here. This is actually an idea that appears in Hasidut as well. It's not just Rosenzweig. That if you see somebody who's half asleep and you call their name, what happens to them? They automatically wake up, right? Even if they're half asleep, right? Because there's something about the way Hasidut at least says it here, um, that when your soul hears its name, it kind of jolts it awake. And what's fascinating about when we hear our name being called is that to awaken, so to speak, is to be wrenched out of the situation that we were previously in, right? Like if I'm in a place in which, you know, I'm the rabbi and I have certain responsibilities as the rabbi with other people, I have this symbolic identity of the rabbi, I dress a certain way, I act a certain way, I think a certain way. And then somebody, somebody calls me Zach, right? It's as if that like rabbinic identity is like left behind for a moment. And there's something about who I am that exceeds it, right? And calling me by my, 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 my personal name, my first name. Right. And for Rosenzweig, the moment of revelation is when we hear God call our name, our first, our first name. And our last name for Rosenzweig is associated again with here, our history, like where we come from. Our first name, right, um, is that thing that when we call it, it kind of rips us out of everything. Uh, and that's what Rosenzweig says here, uh, describing revelation. He says, with the call of the proper name, the world of revelation enters into real dialogue. In the proper name, a breach is open in the fixed wall of thinginess. Right. It's, Something only needs a name if it's singular, right? Otherwise, I can just call it like what it is. It's a pen. It's a paper clip, right? I've got five paper clips here, right? I've got a thing of tape here. I've got papers, right? Once I give something a name, it's saying that it is unlike anything else, even if there's other things in the world like it, right? Uh, let's say I've got this pen here, right? The moment I call this pen a name, I'm going to call it like Norbert, let's say, right? It, this is Norbert. I like to write with Norbert. Right, like it means this is not a pen like other pens. Right, there is something singular about it, something that makes it unique, something that makes it like unlike every everything else. Right, individuals can be part of a set. Right, I can have a set of like you know all these different things that are all kind of the same. But once I give a name to an individual, it makes it fundamentally singular. It makes it unlike anything else, and that's what what happens when revelation comes. Right, we hear our name being called. Right. It, it, it makes us conscious of our own singularity. I'm not like just 
uh, this, you know, this guy who was born in Massachusetts, who went on to become an engineer, but then became a rabbi and learned here and married this person, right? Uh, there's something about a name that separates or exceeds all of that. That's why for Rosenzweig, the name is what captures our Tzalem Elohim, because it marks that place in which we are singular. Because I can call the name of the other, and in that jolting awake, right, that is the way they show how they exceed whatever, again, attributes, definitions we try to, or we or the world tries to, uh, to, to ultimately um, impose a, upon them, right? So revelation of the moment is when God calls our name. Um, and the ultimate question that we're left with in that moment is whether or not we can answer, right? Whether or not we can say, Hineni, we'll pick up with, their, with that um, next week, right? The great challenge for us in modern life, Rosenzweig would argue, is that we're not capable of hearing God call our name. Because the moment where God calls our name is the moment in which everything seems to change for us. The world isn't the world we thought it was before, right? There's now something singular, something transcendent, something miraculous, something impossible that's making its way known, something that we're drawn to, compelled by, right? You hear your name called, you turn, right? You are drawn to it. You're commanded by your name, right? As we'll see a little bit next week, right? You hear somebody call your name, you're commanded to turn, right? And maybe to answer. Um, that's the challenge of having your name being called. But the name, our name being called is always a moment that is singular and exceptional. It doesn't fit into the normal everyday life, right? Those moments when your name is called is where, you know, suddenly you're called to something that exceeds your everyday life. And the reason we don't usually want to answer it is because we know we're not going to be the same afterwards if we say yes. So th I know this is sort of um, not, it gives you hopefully a sense of it, Revelation. Um, we're going to get now next week to what does it mean to try to answer it? And what does it mean to try to stay committed to it? Um, but again, if you, we may not believe in miracles, but the way the world works is the impossible will keep happening to us, right? And we'll have moments if we're willing to be open to it, where it feels like everything is changing, or we're feel we're called to the possibility that everything can and should change. Um, Rosenzweig's thought is about how do we hold open the possibility for those moments? Because if we don't, we're never really going to discover the other, and we're never going to really discover the possibility of 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 us and the world being changed in the process. So I'm um, happy. I, we're probably past time, but I'm happy to open it up to questions if there if there are any. Was there any in the chat by any chance? Uh, there was oh, one thing more. One. Judaism doesn't have a whole lot of miracles. What would be lost if we didn't have the overt miracles of the Exodus? Um, so that's a good question. My point was, this is Rosenzweig's point, is that the miracle is revelation itself. The first, the most foundational miracle. Right? You have to believe revelation is possible on some level. Rosenzweig so, he opens up to the possibility that he says you can't be compelled to believe a miracle of the past happened, right? Like it has to be something that, um, you know, you, you, you come to believe on one form or another, but it can't be forced on you. But again, the miracle that, that has to be there for anything to be meaningful is the possibility of, of revelation, of the infinite coming down and calling the finite's name. Um, and that is not something that we are even so open to today, right? Like, it's not a miracle or impossible. And then we typically think about miracles, water turning into wine, the splitting of the Red Sea or whatever, right? But just even revelation itself is a miracle um, that we have to be open to on some level for religiosity, Judaism, um, to be meaningful in any kind of real way for us. Otherwise, we just, we will shape Judaism in our own eyes, right? If there's no other, if there's no moment of the possibility of the other coming into play, then we will always shape and create Judaism in our own image, um, which is the great temptation, right? If we, you know, reform orthodoxy are basically attempts to shape Judaism in a certain image, our own image, right? Or to freeze God in a certain image, um, the challenge is, is make, being open to the possibility um, that we can't do that, that there is something beyond us that makes its will known um, and that compels us. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Trubov, and uh, thank you so much to uh, everyone who participated uh, today, uh, not only here on Zoom, but also on Facebook. Um, Mishnah learning uh, continues this fall. We have uh, this uh, Sunday's class at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern uh, with um, Rabbi David Silber on Masechet Yevamot. Um, just a note that uh, Rabbi Silber's class, uh, Genesis to Exodus, from Family to Nation, will not meet this Sunday, uh, but it will resume on November uh, 12th. 
And just another side note is uh, a reminder that uh, the Eastern US uh, will switch over to winter time this Sunday. So in the meantime, um, uh, so, so the time difference is, is, uh, will, will be different. I will return to seven hours uh, next, uh, this Sunday. And also, um, uh, we have uh, many more classes happening. You can look uh, at our schedule at 5784.risha.org uh, slash fall. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week. And lehitrarat. Okay.